Yeah. Drawn by Walter Corbin in 1938. He also drew one of the uh, Bridge Street Cemetery and many others throughout Western Massachusetts. Um, but uh, Sarah Askin is here in this picture that used to, to be at Cosme and Hall. Okay? And um, I will just read one piece from this um, wonderful book description of each of these people that she just chose by Anna Pauline Friedrich, who is, I believe, number nine on your map. We'll go by her marker. And, um, whoa! <sighs> Pauline Friedrich's uh, rather quirky voice, so bear with her. Mrs. Askin was a jolly, good-natured, colored woman. She was kind, friendly, kind, and sociable. She was fleshy, was a splendid housekeeper, and was noted for her cooking. She belonged to the Ladies' Industrial Union and was an active member. She usually served at the head of all public suppers given in the hall. Her husband deserted her when her children were small. She had six children, two dying when very young. She supported her family by doing washings and working out of the day. By frugality and self-denial, she saved enough to buy a home of her own on Nonatuck Street. It was a double home, and after her son Luther married, he lived on the other side. It was very hard for her to do her laundry work as she had an infected limb. She would put a cushion in her chair, knee on that, and in that way managed to do her washings. Um, so this is the story of, part of the story of Sarah Askin. But think of her, she presided at this huge hall. Cosmian Hall was so large that it sat 500 people upstairs, 500 people downstairs, in, uh, that they could all serve and sit there and have dinner together. This was no small task for somebody to preside at those dinners. And one of the, so this is the rest of uh, the a number of her children that survived. Her son, Lyman Stone, appears to be missing. I have no idea where it might be. Um, and there's a little story of the number of these. Uh, I'll just mention one of Sarah Askin's claims to fame as being the mother of Luther Askin. Uh, and by Brian Turner's researches has uh, found out that Luther was the first African-American to play on an integrated baseball team in the country. And here we are, World Series, you know, it's a baseball time. The Florence Eagle was a force of nature here in Florence and beat some of the best teams. These young boys who stayed home weren't old enough to play in the Civil War to go, I mean, go, go fight in the Civil War, learn the game, the new game of baseball on their own and beat some of the best teams in the around and won the Silver Ball Championship here in Western Mass. Two of those members uh, buried here uh, went on to become mayors of Northampton. So, uh, any questions about this uh, burial site here? Number one, it's actually number one on Lottie Corbin's amazing detail that my friend Fran Crumpold here has taken and moved into a database that we're working on to provide a database of every burial here. And it's also, if you go on Find a Grave, have people found Find a Grave? Type in Find a Grave, type in Park Street Cemetery, and P.K. Magruder has documented 758 markers here. So you can always find it online too. So the very circular uh, constitution of the Northampton Association and decided to come out and join the association and married Octavia Damon from Chesterfield. And Octavia Damon, as it turns out, was the final, the last utopian community member to uh, die. And here she is with one of our personal favorites here in Florence, Marion Turner. And uh, I'll, I'll read something again from Pauline Friedrichs about, about uh, the... Uh, so the Atkins were white? Atkins were white, yep. 
And uh, Mr. James Dunn Atkins was a printer, and I think partly because he was a craftsman, in a way, uh, he was chosen to learn how to dye. From the the community had hired an English-born uh, dyer, Edward Valentine, to do their dyeing, uh, but they paid him, and he wasn't a member, and that really didn't sit well. In true worker co-op style, you really want everybody to be members who's doing that important work. So they trained James Dunn Atkins to do the dyeing, and he went on to become one of the founding stockholders of the Nonatuck Silk Company that took over from uh, the utopian community. Um, he was a man of few words, had a keen sense of humor, and had a hearty laugh. He had a fund of amusing stories which he enjoyed telling. He never smoked or drank. He would advise people to drink a small amount of kerosene oil to cure a cold. <laughs> he was the head dyer in the Nonatuck Silk Mill and was a heavy stockholder. He had a habit of carrying fruit or candy in his pocket, and when passing through the rooms where the girls work, he would deposit a piece of candy or an orange pear or some other fruit on their table and depart without a word. If he heard of any family that were having a hard time and they had a daughter working in the mill, he would make it a point to pass her machine and then quietly lay a gold piece or a bill on her machine and go before he could, she could thank him. So this. I mean, this is that kind of good-spirited sort of entrepreneurism, paternalism, that this is what, in a sense, the utopian true cooperative ideal morphed into were these benign, largely benign, because as you find out, Florence it went a long time before they ever had a strike here. So Samuel Hill and others and, uh, and James Dunn Atkins um, were part of that. Here's. I'll pass this one around. I love this picture. This is the, uh, these are the white men who, f so many former members of the utopian community um, who took over in Florence. And James Dunn Atkins is the tall, skinny one in the middle. But um, <clears throat> I want to read before we move on, and I can tell this is going, I'm going to have to slide by quickly some of the other burials because. Um, there's just so much to say about all of them. Um, Mrs. Atkins was born in Chesterfield and when a young lady kept company with Mr. Atkins. She would go to work at five in the morning and at seven go home to get her breakfast, get the children up and dressed and then return to work. Many times she would take her youngest son, Fred, who is also buried here, I believe. Is that true? He's, here's Fred, um, who was a baby at the time uh, back with her and let him creep and play around the machinery um, or go to sleep on her coat which she spread on the floor. You know, that, I mean I love this stuff because it gives you the image of these real people, you know. And that's partly what we're talking about is invoking these wonderful people. Um, she was very social nature and would attend all the social affairs held in the town. <clears throat> um, She was domestic, and it was told that when she and Mr. Atkins had been riding on, on their way home, oh wait, wait, I'm sorry, she was not domestic, and it was told that when she and Mr. Atkins had been out riding on their way home, they would stop at the stores, buy their food, which was put up in a paper bag, in paper bags, put these bags on the table, and then proceed to eat. Fast food. I'm going, oh my gosh. After her health failed her, she had a colored man by the name of Marion Turner, this is Marion Turner, to look after her wants. He served her as cook, attendant, companion, and nurse and was very devoted to her. She was of the average height, quite fleshy again, and had auburn hair and lived to be old. When Marion Turner first came to work for Mrs. Atkins, he was dressed as a woman and dressed that way for some time and was spoken of as she. Then he appeared one day dressed as a man and dressed that way for some time. Then he would alternate going back to women's clothes. He kept everyone guessing was he a man or a woman much to his own amusement. Finally he wore men's clothes all the time saying it was easier to do his work as he had the care of the horse, the lawn and his household duties besides. He was patient, kind and very good to Mrs. Atkins. So this is Florence at the turn of the century, okay? 
still with remnants of this a utopian tolerance and open-mindedness that was still with these finally founders finally dying off and their second generation taking over. By 1926, with the death of Arthur Hill, Florence is a very, very different place. This is the stone for George, the son of Josiah and Sarah Hayward, formerly of Salem, died October 24, 1843, at 22 months. Um, a new member of the David Ruggles Center, Marie Trope. Is that right, Trope? Tropey? Okay, I finally got it right. Marie Tropey did some research. We were wondering why there's so many deaths in 1843. Um, and as it turns out, there was a uh, influenza epidemic um, around that year. So we see a lot of those deaths in 1843. And George was the son of Josiah, Sarah, and Sarah Hayward. Um, and in the garrison letters, and those are going to come up here as we go along, uh, William Lloyd Garrison um, was possibly the you know, the biggest influence, political influence on the people here. And uh, in his letters, it says that this, that Josiah Hayward was an African-American. And that's the only place we find that. And Marie Panic and others that we've done research um, were wondering whether, how, why would somebody of that, uh, I forget who the editor of that batch of letters was, why would they say that if it weren't true? But we haven't found it confirmed anywhere else. But I, I'm wondering about Florence. What, this cemetery, African-American burials are sprinkled throughout the cemetery. But we are in an African-American section here, in a sense, because we are at the gray, unmarked grave of Henry Anthony. And his, was Maria Anthony, do we know her to be Irish? Yes, she is Irish. So he married two, Henry Anthony married two Irish women at least, and he had a third wife too, I believe. Um, but at any rate, uh, his children, Harriet and uh, John, were buried here, um, would have been mixed race. And it makes me wonder whether or not Josiah, you know, George was buried near the Anthonys because the other young burials that we're going to see later on, Eliza Benson and Ebenezer Stetson, are down there with the more with the utopian community folks. I wonder. I have to wonder. So there's this is almost like an evidence that perhaps he was African American. They were buried in Salem, I think. He was in Springfield for a while, but I think he went back to Salem. In Salem. So um, Henry Anthony. Uh, I don't know really anything about Maria other than she was Irish American. So here we have a mixed race marriage early on in Florence. Henry Anthony was here before uh, the utopian community came here. And uh, uh, he was a fiddler, he was a farmer, um, and he may well have been the African American fiddler with a, a, a wife and a babe in arms who attended the Thanksgiving cer uh, ceremony uh, in the household of Lydia Mariah and David Lee Child here, uh, because here was a fiddler and the age of uh, these children at the time, because they didn't die in infants, I mean, they weren't infants, they were three years old, so about that time. So she writes about a fiddler having a great time with her African-American uh, retainers, she called them, after the form of the old uh, way the nobles would refer to their help, because uh, I believe Henry Anthony helped her with the farm. Um, we don't have time to talk about Lydia Mariah Child much, but uh, I also, at the end of this, I, for one day only, we have free African American Heritage Trail maps, if you would like one as well. Come uh, grab one, and Lydia Mariah Child's story is told there. Josiah White. I cut myself. Okay. Josiah White had this linseed oil factory down at the dam on Nonatuck Street. It's one of the very earliest industrial sites in Florence. 
and Josiah White was the man who donated this plot of land where we are now. Thank you, dear. Uh, how did I do on a chair? I have a bandage in my car if you want I'm right there. I think it's gonna it'll okay. be fine. Um, thank you, though. So he donated this, and Betsy, is it Betsy Howe? Yes. Betsy Howe, is this the earliest burial? Mm -hmm. Right here, November. 29th, 1825. Uh, he donated the land in 1820, and uh, a fellow we'll talk about later, Alfred P. Critchlow, in 1858, donated another big plot of land to, to, to complete the cemetery. So, Steve, you're but, saying uh, that he donated the land in 1820, but it wasn't for five more years until someone was buried? That's what it says in Sheffield's history of huh. Florence. Why do you think that was? Maybe nobody died. Five years? <laughs> well, the word, here's the thing. Before the advent of the utopian community, there were probably only six or seven houses up here. There was not much. There was more going on in Leeds than Florence mm -hmm. at this time. So there weren't very many people. And the people that worked in, in, up here mostly were landowners from Northampton who had extra farmland up here. So uh, Benjamin Barrett had his homes. big, he was a doctor in Northampton and had farmland up here that he worked. So mm -hmm. they weren't, many people weren't living up here. So it could have been a spotty thing, but there were maybe beginning to be enough people to have have a cemetery, to think about a cemetery. Thank you. But, um, but we, also we have one, you know, what's that? Cemeteries, the um, association people were burying them where we think it was anyway where the um, main field is, yeah. remember? Yeah, and behind there on the hillside. On the hillside. And we're going to talk about a discovery. Thanks to doing this, we discovered something that Lottie Corbin was not clear about here, about Anna Elizabeth Benson. Yeah. She was uh, buried right there behind uh, the hillside. So they were burying people down there. Maybe that didn't feel quite right. They you know, wanted a better burial ground. They were just kind of burying people under trees, different places. I don't know. But uh, here's sort of an urn and willow, a willow motif from the 1820s. You know, we don't get, we don't have that much to say about different stones here. Is that right, Faith? Yeah, and I think, um, again, earlier stones, some of the slate stones that we know about in burials in the 1700s, the icons that were on them were often um, the death's head or a skull and crossbone or something rather ominous and very, very sad. And then gradually other icons that were maybe more hopeful were added to stone. So the willow tree is a symbol of, of kind of everlasting life and life going on because if you cut a willow at any point, and put it in water or put it in the soil, it regenerates. And so here's this symbol of regeneration and of hope on a stone. So uh, any uh, other observations? I really invite Ed, anybody to talk uh, about any of this stuff. It's in, well, was the cemetery affiliated with a church? Well, in, eight, in ori uh, originally, Josiah White, as it turns out, was one of the founders of the Unitarian, the Second uh, Congregational Church in Northampton. If you go down to the UU in Northampton, his name's right on the plaque there as you walk in the door. So he was downtown. I think increasingly it became a mixed uh, cemetery between the Florence Congregational Church and Cosmian Hall. Uh, here we go. Cosmian Hall, it's good before we leave that. So you can see, here's Lily Library looking right behind you here. So I'll get on this side of you all. Here's Lily Library. Okay. And this is what sat in basically a little behind the yellow Forum Civic Center. And it was known as the Temple of Free Speech. And, and, and what year was that built? It was built in 1873 dedicated in 1873 after the Free Congregational Society, which was the organizational descendant of the utopian community, um, was for 10 years down at the Florence Community Center on Pine Street. 
and after 10 years they built this even larger you know it was still growing as a, as a congregation and Susan B Anthony Frederick Douglass Ralph Waldo Emerson Lucy Stone any number of reformers came here to speak at the uh, at Cosmian Hall and, and the bell is still there. And we rang the bell. We, we rang, rang the, the bell, bell on uh, New Year's Day in commemoration of the Emancipation Proclamation. And that bell was forged in 1863. What uh, 1948. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not much of a conspiracy theory guy, right? But if you think about what was going on in 1948, there, were, there wasn't much preservation of people, self-described communists in the country. But, you know, I don't know. It, it really had, who knows, the building may not have been that well built, parts of it. It had this very ambitious tower. Is there controversy in the town or the town? No. Not really. <laughs> not really. The YMCA brought it. Yeah. And they had it analyzed by the state. And analyzed and it was going to cost too much to do anything with it. Yep. And um, then they, uh, who's he there? The congregational people wanted to try and keep it, but they couldn't, and that's when they sold it and tore it down. Hmm. So this is the Bottom family. Samuel Bottom, and he, that's, this is an interesting layout here. Here's Father. Father Samuel and Mother Lenora, and they were early, I think even founding members of the uh, um, Northampton Association of Education and Industry, but left very shortly after that. Um, and his picture is among uh, the people that in, are in the picture on the uh, wall at Cosmian Hall. Um, he would not enter into arguments at the church service, as so many were accustomed to do. He always lived in the same large house on Main Street. His house was up where, uh, near where Cooper's is now, um, and dying at a ripe old age. Um, he, uh, he was also in his obituary um, mentioned as Underground Railroad, helping uh, fugitive slaves as well. Um, and he opened up High Street. He had a, about 100 acres of land up between High Street, Florence, and Bridge Road, and down and down off the end of here, he owned some bottom land. Yeah, bottom land. <laughs> yeah. um, I just wanted to mention because it's something we're rather proud of. Because I have to admit, uh, a uh, part of what we I enjoy doing here is finding all these houses. They moved houses all over Florence, right? <laughs> Zenas Field, the moving is man in Florence was brought Josiah White's cottage, also known as the Child Cottage, also known as the Moon Cottage, was part of the Northampton Association of Education and Industry Building, and it's inside that White House. And here, uh, we went in, we, we narrowed it down, and we finally, because that was the story we wanted to confirm, so you knock on the door and you invite yourself in, and inside it is the old framework of an 18, probably an 1810 chestnut, uh, with chestnut beams across the bottom. So it's inside Morris McCall's house, which is somewhat ironic for those of us who know who Morris McCall was. He's buried here too. What's that? I don't know Morris McCall. Okay. Well, we have this great story about uh, on July 8th, 1856, there was a big uh, Fremont for Freedom rally up at the Pine Grove behind Florence Congregational Church. And speaking on the same platform with Alfred Lilly and others was Sojourner Truth, Basil Dorsey, who we're gonna see, and, and Thomas H. Jones. And Morris McCall got up, and he was one of the people that liked to hear him, himself speak, not unlike me, um, at the Florence Lyceum. He was one of the people, leading lights of the Florence Lyceum, but he got up and said, if the South can get the votes for slavery, they have the perfect right to bring it here or into Kansas or wherever they can take it, right? And Thomas H. Jones, a fugitive slave, got up on the podium and gave him a severe but just rebuke. <laughs> so at any rate, Morris McCall probably, that probably wasn't all, he, you know, he was probably a great guy, I don't know. <laughs> 
careful past these out please because we're going to do something here a little different for Halloween which is more like as you'll find out more uh, but because Halloween's a scary time when the dead can have uh, can mess with us and we actually invite them to but in these cases we're really here to honor these people who we love You have my what? So Lottie Corbin, uh, to her great credit, wrote this little history for the 75th anniversary of the Free Congregational Society. Okay? Um, and no doubt Walter did the calligraphy on the cover. He was an incredible calligrapher, I think. And uh, in here we find out and I'll read this to you because we're kind of here. For many years, Memorial Sunday was observed each June. The Sunday school pupils would meet as usual for the opening service, then pass reverently over to the Park Street Cemetery, where the graves of former members of the society would be decorated. Reassembling at the grave of Mr. Burley, they would sing several of his favorite hymns. One hymn was usually, It Singeth Low in Every Heart, written by Reverend John W. Chadwick, a speaker often heard here at Cosmian Hall, and sung to the tune of Old Lang Syne. Okay, but first let me show you Charles and Gertrude Burley and talk a little bit about them. Of all the people here I'll never do justice, Charles Burley is one of them. And here he is. In probably 1845, I think, Marie, this is a daguerreotype from a daguerreotype down at Historic Northampton. If you look into your Sheffield history of Florence, and I encourage you to do that, we sell it up at, it's available as a Google book, you can find it, look up, see if you can find Charles Burley, he comes up in a search there. And Samuel J. May, who was one of the leading abolitionists and the only Unitarian minister in Brooklyn, was caught up in the Prudence Crandall case, which I can't go into, down in Canterbury, Connecticut. And Samuel J. May enlisted uh, Char the young Charles C. Burley, who was out in the field uh, while he was probably studying to go become one of the youngest people ever to pass the bar in Connecticut. A brilliant, a brilliant student. Uh, Samuel J. May went out and re recruited Burley to take over at a very young age a, a magazine called The Unionist and, and work for the abolition of slavery. And from that point on, Burley was out on the stump speaking against slavery constantly. And he, he though the people that founded Florence no doubt knew Burley and knew his family well, he never was a member here in the early days, in the 1842, in the, the association. He was out as an itinerant speaker for the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society and the Connecticut Anti-Slavery Society. But he finally ended up here in 1858, and the former utopians invited him to become their speaker. Not their minister, because that didn't work for these Garrisonians, but to become their speaker. And he did, and he, he did it for uh, over 10 years. So at any rate, without further ado, and Gertrude was a, a wonderful, uh, she died younger, uh, her name was Gertrude Kimber Burley, and was a member of the anti-slavery, women's anti-slavery society in Connecticut. Um, so at any rate, here we go. Only the first three verses, okay? And we don't sing the chorus. And if you want, I will sing the first verse, okay? And then we'll take off for the second verse. You ready? It singeth low in every heart. Mm, wrong tune. It singeth low in every heart. We hear it each and all. The song of those who answer not, however we may call. All together. They from the silence of the breast We see them as of yore The kind, the true, the brave, the sweet Who walk with us no more 
is hard to take the burden off when these have laid it down they brighten all the joy of life they soften every frown thank you very much <laughs> Everybody knew that he was one of the very best speakers and the greatest logical minds that abolition had uh, on their side, correct? I mean, very, very widely known and very widely respected. Of all our Florence people, he may well be the uh, most famous, most uh, um, elevated uh, abolitionist we had here. And that I mean, Ruggles was here, and Ruggles would have been with here, and he should have been in this cemetery in a sense. David Ruggles, who our, our uh, center is named after, died in 1849, and his family took his body back to Norwich, Connecticut, where he was buried in an unmarked grave. Um, and I, I've been to, uh, to the Bennington, Vermont uh, graveyard, and uh, William Ellery Channing died there, but was taken back to Boston for burial, but they have a wonderful marker for him there. And it would not, I think it make, kind of makes sense that we might have a marker here, and also one for Sojourner Truth, who's buried in Battle Creek. Why not? Okay, and uh, the family uh, of Burley, because this, all these stones are getting deteriorating, put this wonderful piece here. I will mention one other thing here, okay? These are the Burley kids. Burley's son, Charles C. Burley Jr., was a great artist. In fact, if you do a, he'll, he'll come up in any Google search. He went off to uh, Germany to uh, study art and died there young. Um, what, the age of 30, 34, looks like. Uh, their house is up on, uh, 85 North Main Street where his studio was and they both sons married Aldrich daughters and these were the daughters of Orita Aldrich who was the first kindergartner at the Florence Kindergarten so it's sort of an interesting little I mean Fran do you know anything more about or want to say anything more about well, she it? Went with them when they went to Germany. She went well, to Germany? Yeah. A, a painting of Orita Aldrich by Charles Burley hangs down there. It's really wonderful yeah, painting. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'll pass it around because I, I find it to be one of my uh, favorite pieces. Oh, it'll be one of those I can't find right off. But see, normally this is like very well organized. <laughs> um, oh no, I put it with Burley. Hey. Hey. This is, uh, I'll pass this around because it's really wonderful. This was kind of rediscovered at the Florence Congregational Church. And this was done by Charles Burley Jr. And uh, Grow Food Northampton, actually, we got permission to use this part of it uh, for promotion, for, for promoting Grow Food Northampton early because it's taken down to the bottom of the hill. And Steve, did Charles Burley die here in the uh, great <laughs> He did. He did. Oh, yeah. He was hit by a train, and uh, people, they uh, could not fit everybody in Cosmian Hall. So think of Cosmian Hall fit 500 people. There was standing room only, and uh, the, the Cosmian Hall was filled outside. Uh, abolitionists from all over sent their, uh, their condolences. This is very skewed, but the Littlefield family here and other families you see around uh, were all members of the Florence Congregational Church. And as we begin to think of what the, um, <clears throat> what the uh, association or um, alliance that we could pull together to help this cemetery, it would be a, a wide group of people, the Florence Congregational Church, the Unitarian Society in Northampton, the, the uh, Florence Civic and Business Association have expressed an interest. The American Association for Graveyard Studies, Bob Drinkwater is very interested in this cemetery. T.K. Magruder would help. So we have a lot going for us 
and uh, but it's never easy to raise money, you know, as as no, and this takes money um, to do it. Four out of the nine zinc markers in Northampton are here in this cemetery. There's another one over there, uh, Schaeffler. And they often, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a German aspect to some of these zinc yeah. markers, I believe. Um, I think one of these, one of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I thought there was a German uh, part of this family too, but maybe not. So Alfred P. Critchlow, if you Google the history of plastic, just type in Google history of plastic, on page one, Alfred P. Critchlow comes up. And he was the inventor of the Florence compound. Um, and he came here from Nottingham, England, was re recruited by the Hayden brothers of Hayden, Haydenville to come make button. And then he came here to Florence and invented the Florence compound and began to make daguerreotype cases. Um, daguerreotypes were invented in 1839 and they uh, kind of caught fire and it became clear it'd be nice to give, to make a nice keepsake for them. Um, Marie, uh, who's here today, probably knows more than anybody about Alfred P. Critchlow uh, and has studied and is working on documenting his really amazing uh, industrial career here. For us at the Ruggles Center, he's also a hero uh, because he's a known um, agent, of the under agent of the Underground Railroad. I, I say that because his role was somewhat specific. He would hire mostly children of fugitive slaves who settled here in Florence in his factory, but he's also the man who harbored the fugitive slave French in his factory in the one case that we have documented of a slave catcher coming to Florence in search of his slave. Uh, this is in Sheffield's history. Um, so Alfred P. Critchlow, let me show you uh, a picture of him. Um, I find him, I love his, his picture. Here he is. There he is. He was a little man, but he stood up to big bullies. Anybody else want to talk about Critchlow? Say a few words about him? He went on uh, to, he left Florida, he sold out his company in 1854, I think, to other interests who finally developed it into the Florence Manufacturing Company, which then went on to become the Prophylactic Brush Company, the largest employer around for a while here in the Valley. Um, and he moved back to Leeds, and I think his house is still there in Leeds, and Fran, we can't see it from here. I wish we were, were yeah, we, uh, we've identified his house. It's one of the newer houses that we've, um, it was moved to make way for the ugliest uh, thing ever happened to a building. <laughs> Samuel Porter's mansion at the top of Corticelli Street. If you go up Corticelli Street, where it meets Pine Street, you, there, there used to be this incredibly modern for the day. It was a William Fenno Pratt house built for Samuel Porter, who was the head of the Nonatuck Silk Company. And now it's just the worst thing you've ever seen. It's one of those projects that we're going to get to tear that off at some point. That's where the, um, where the rest home is. Right. To build that big mansion, they moved Critchlow's little house around the corner, and it's this somewhat threatened. Starting in about in the mid 1870s, they were called white bronze. And there's only one company that was making them called the Monumental Bronze Company that was located in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And they made all sorts of claims about their long lasting ability and all of the things that, that they would do. And they were much less expensive than buying a stone of marble or granite. And one of the things that they did, the, the lettering and the icons on them have lasted very well. But since they were cast, then an end of metal, you can see there's something called creep that this is happening. The weight of the top begins to push on the bottom and as it creeps out and begins to split. But an interesting period of time. And the, the interest in them lasted for about 50 years and after that, People went back to the greater permanence of stone. 
so an interesting piece in graveyard history. It was already had been broken and repaired. And this is the gravestone of George W. Hoder it says Hoderstia. We see it as Hodestia too. Born a slave in Maryland. Um, died in 1880. And uh, one of the things to take in, it's his burial is right next to Laura Knowles Washington. And um, <coughs> I would just want to read the piece in my little book about, I can find it. So. The Laura Knowles Washington, uh, her house is at 9 Florence Road. And um, I'll just grab her piece here. So one of the things when I'm out giving walking tours uh, on the African American Heritage Trail, people notice I race ahead. So I get to the spot and I get my stuff. In a cemetery, it's like you're in a closed little loop. So you kind of have to be more prepared. Um, but I will find this momentarily. Here we go. These are like matching stones. They're like matching stones, and, and I'm going to read the story if I, I hope it's in here. And I can't find, anybody see my little book? I have no recollection. So uh, I'll read this from, uh, from one piece about Laura Knowles Washington from uh, Arthur G. Hill, who we're going to uh, talk about. He, he wrote a piece called Florence, the Mecca of the Colored Race. And uh, among other things, uh, Florence and Abolition Days, he, he, without him and without uh, Friedrich and Sheffield, we would be in tough shape here, but we were l lucky. And so here's what he says about Laura Knowles Washington. Um, who afterward, uh, Laura Knowles Washington, who afterwards married Thomas Washington, became a well-known resident. By careful management and oversight of her husband's idiosyncrasies, <laughs> she became the owner of considerable real estate, real estate property, now the center of Mr. James Meehan's little village on South Street. And so her house is at 9 uh, Florence Road, which used to be called South Street, uh, near the Silk Mill Dam. After the death of her husband, Richard Cole became enamored of her, but was driven from the competition by George W. Hodestia from New York, who in the struggle broke Mr. Cole's leg. Ooh. <laughs> Mr. Hodestia became the sexton of Park Street Cemetery and upon dying was buried there. Okay, um, now, so what? A, it, this is ironic, right? Mm -hmm. Here's the sexton of the cemetery stone, having once been broken but and then put up. It was already patched sort of badly and now it's fallen over again. Um, I do want I need to find my little book. Anybody see it? Okay. Steve, the orange book. Go ahead. Yeah. While Steve oh, is finding <laughs> his little book, what we're going to do is pass a basket around. And on these walks, we like everybody to give some sort of a contribution which helps the work of the David Ruggles Center. So Steve will find the book and you yeah. all look into your pocket. About Because I have it fairly well in memory. It's just it's better to read it. Uh, Laura Knowles Washington, like, you know, in many ways, like Sarah Askin, um, she did what were what would be considered sort of, you know, chores that white people didn't want to do. I think she would sell rags, she would uh, go in and do cleaning, and she saved money to be able to buy her house um, or, or at least manage her her strange husband's affairs. If you look at the deeds of that house. It said somebody will give her a mortgage as long as Thomas has nothing to do with it. Francine, that deed. It's pretty amazing, you know, getting it to the, the actual documentation of what was said in that piece, you know. It's so, oh, that's interesting. But at any rate, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, nothing beats uh, actually reading it um, because uh, I find it very moving, her story. She lived on South Street, now the Mian property, and Mr. Hodestia was born a slave, boarded with her. He supported himself by doing whitewashing. 
he died October 20th, 1888, and was buried in the same lot with her in the Park Street Cemetery. She went out working by the day, did washings, and collected garbage. She had made for herself a rather large cart, built well upon the sides, painted green, which she used to carry her pails of garbage or her baskets of clothes. One could hear her shambling and scuffling. This is, this is Anna Paulina Friedrich again. As she came down the street, drawing her wagon behind her, she wore loose fitting, loose ill-fitting shoes. She wore a long loose wrapper that trailed in the dirt and the dust as she went around the town doing her errands. She was seen once to take a handful of sugar and deposit it with the rest of the food in her big pockets. Um, she had in her possession some eight or ten beautiful dresses she had collected when working for rich people. These dresses she often loaned to people taking part in plays. They had all sorts of plays at Cosmian Hall. Uh, so she was an attendant at Cosmian Hall. This is why she's in this book. They were usually in great demand. Children were afraid of her as she was, <laughs> she was very dark and she would roll her eyes and show a mouthful of white teeth when laughing. She was friendly and kind to those who were good to her but resented any criticism or fault finding. But here's the part that got me. So she's saving what she can. She had accumulated some money and upon her death she had left it to the, Cooley, the Dickinson Hospital for a free bed for colored people, but it was never used for that purpose. Yeah. You know, that, I bet it was used. But that, that, I mean, I'm, this is what she, part of what she did. She also bought a stone for herself and for George. We don't know exactly what their story was. It sounds like it was amorous to me. They were living together out of wedlock at 9 Florence Road. Thank you for finding that. I don't other than just obviously the <laughs> classical theme and obelisk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I've done my best. Oftentimes what comes, and we're, as you can tell, we, we are able to talk a lot about the women in Florence. That also is unusual, not just African Americans but being able to tell stories about women who are neglected. I don't know enough about Eliza Hammond. I know that she went out of her way to bring her piano up into the factory boarding house when they were celebrating their new dining hall. Um, and I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to diss Samuel Hill, who we're about to talk to, but uh, Samuel Hill. Um, What's that? that day. He wasn't very nice that day. That day, he must have been in a bad mood. Right. But anyway, rate, they were celebrating Dolly Stetson, who we hear this letter through, uh, and uh, was part of the, uh, the group of women who were, who were dancing, right? Mm. Samuel Hill, I think he went over and closed the piano yeah. lid down and said, it's nine o'clock, time to go home and get to bed. We have work to do. Dolly Stetson, and I encourage people to look for this book. It's for sale down at Historic Northampton always. It's called uh, Letters from an American Utopia. And it's a really wonderful insight into what the going, real workings of the community were about in many ways. And we find out that through Dolly's voice that this was one of the things that tore the community apart, where people there were people there from mostly from Eastern Mass. A lot of the dancers were from from Eastern Mass that wanted, you know, Sophia Ford was another. You got to look up Sophia Ford. But at any rate, she was one of the dancers. At any rate, she Dolly just goes off. She says, you know, who stays up till one or two in the night counting money and making young children do that? Uh, you know, feed whatever they were doing, feeding silkworms or working in the, the silk room, she just loses it. Anyway, but this was Eliza Hammond. So she and her husband, and this is him, Elisha Hammond, um, our connection with him begins really in the Garrison Letters, where we find that uh, up in New Ipswich, New Hampshire, where they were from, Garrison went there to have his portrait painted. And he, this was during the early days of the community, and he suggested that Eli Elisha and Eliza come here and become members, which they did. And uh, they came here with big dreams to turn this into a much 
more beautiful place than than was ever going to happen and what which it was ever possible they were in a sense esthetes okay and uh but he was a great he was a great man and a great painter we think and he painted this portrait of frederick Douglass. we believe this is the portrait it's being contested as we speak down at the national portrait gallery uh, of Frederick Douglass one month before he published his most famous of all slave narratives here. I mean, he published it in, in I think, in Boston, but he was here uh, one month before it was published, having his painting painted. And we found recently, not that, I mean, Fran and I were lucky enough to get into his house and determine that the little brown cottage uh, over on Maple Street, which does, again, doesn't look like an 1845 cottage, but it is. It's all timber framing inside, and then we have the Stetson letters come across, and we know the exact week it was put up, thanks to the Stetson letters.